Hello and welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. Welcome. You are most welcome on this creative journey here in the Northwoods of Maine. This episode has a variety of different skills and projects to share. And I also include a quick trip to camp. If you are a patron of this podcast or contribute financially from coffee, a deep heartfelt thank you. I am so appreciative of all of the support and momentum that keeps this vlog going. I couldn't do it without you. I'm so glad you're here. Let's catch up. to fool around with marbling paper for a couple years now. Um, I saw a class offered on Creative Bug. I <clears throat> ran into this particular art form in some of my bookbinding uh, forays um, in the past couple years. And so finally this spring, I gathered the materials together and I gave it a shot. If you are a patron, you'll know that I did this with my mom and Teresa. I've done it a couple times to just get a feel for the whole process. And um, I really enjoy it. Again, it's another it's similar to the gel plate. Um, marbling is uh, creating monoprints uh, using size and uh, different paints on, um, on water. And so instead of using a printing plate or a gel plate, um, you create a thickened water using carrageenan, uh, which is a seaweed extract, and you can put pigment onto this um, plate, if you will, because your 
relying on the physics of surface tension um, between the paint and the size, the carrageenan, the, the thickness and the viscosity of that. And you lay your paper down and that's what allows you to take a print. Now there's probably a lot of physics there, surface tension, etc., that I'm not capable of um, explaining or have the vocabulary, but I do understand that I need a, um, a dispersant. I need that paint to disperse across the surface and I also need it to be lighter than the size because I don't want my pigments to sink. And a lot of the research that I've been doing the past couple of years has been around what paints I can use. Originally, I bought the Jacquard kit. Uh, Jacquard Dyes makes a water marbling kit. It comes with carrageenan and it comes with the primary colors so you can mix colors. Um, and the paint is already thinned to a consistency and has the added dispersants that you, that you might need. So dispersants can be Dawn dishwashing liquid, photo focus, which is used in uh, photography development, um, and you can use oxgall and you can use synthetic oxgall. And so the kit comes with all of that for you to play with. But I was really interested in fooling around with lots of different types of pigments and paints, um, specifically watercolor and gouache. Um, my journey in paper uh, and printing really began with my interest in encaustic. Uh, encaustic is a medium of Demar resin and beeswax. And you use it, uh, you can use it a lot of different ways, but I love the idea of collaging and then using that as a finish. Um, it creates texture, it has um, kind of a um, really earthy kind of feel to it and the way it kind of um, cures. But with uh, encaustic using that particular um, medium, you cannot, well, you're not recommended to put acrylics underneath it because it won't bond to the acrylic. So that's what really got me started in understanding printing processes, what can I use, and why I did a bunch of research on paper marbling and using watercolor and gouache um, and acrylics, of course. I didn't want to just be stuck and pigeonholed into this one kit. So all of that to be said, um, I have branched out of the Jacquard kit and I am using Golden High Flow Acrylics, an assortment of those. Um, they do need to be thinned with water and they also sometimes need to um, they what they call be balanced to your size so different pigments in the paint have different um, reactions with the size which reacts with the paint and so they can get pushy and you may have seen that where I would put some down it would just push it real thin to the side so it had a lot of um, disperse um, or I guess I could say surface tension it wanted to move out so um, learning how to balance your paints and enables you to kind of work with heavy bodied acrylics. You can water them up and add your own dispersant. You can use the high flow, you can use airbrushing paint, and you can use water watercolor and gouache, which I haven't tried yet. Now, one of the things that comes up frequently um, in the discussion is to mordant your paper. I tried both ways. I had a hard time understanding why I would need to mordant my paper with alum if I was using acrylic paint. Um, so I'm still kind of grappling with that. I have pulled my paints and rinsed them. I do get some of it running off with the, wow, the squirrels are really angry today. Um, but I don't lose my whole print. And in the classes that I watched, um, the instructor did not mordant her paper and she didn't rinse it either. So when I pull my print off of the carrageenan size, I let it dry and then I've practiced rinsing it and I'm not losing any of the paint. It's not just, you know, washing off the paper. So I did try mordanting it. I did find that a bit, um, of a rigmarole when you want to kind of just print and print and print and print you're not really sure where you're going to end up to like pre mordant you know 35 papers or 20 papers and also to mordant um 
papers that are not heavy for heavy with um you know heavier in their weight that would be very interesting i guess what i'm trying to say is mixed media and watercolor paper don't tend to react as well for me on the surface because they are a rough um, texture comparatively the paper that i chose to use was just a nice copy paper um, that you would use for um, print color print in your inkjet and i also use some nice uh, printing paper from speedball i gave that a try both of those when i mordanted them did not take the water well and then you're supposed to press them flat um, because obviously when you lay your paper down onto your print you want that surface um, the two surfaces to meet so i just didn't really have a lot of luck with that um, i do think though using gouache and watercolor you're going to want to mordant your paper if you're using pigments um, that do not have any um, plastic <laughs> acrylic additive to them um, i think that's going to be an important skill to develop so i'm not mordanting them um, you if you choose to pursue this experience can experiment um, i don't have a recommendation one way or the other so paper marbling has been a really interesting and I am branching out with understanding what papers I can use. Um, I'll just give you a little sneak peek of what I've been working on um, lately and what's coming in July. I'm doing some book binding and playing around with different uh, hard, case, hard cases. Um, you can see that I use one of my heat press um, papers for the end paper and so i'm just kind of building some skills i, I want to pull a couple different printing techniques together into um, a couple different types of books so forthcoming um, and i think in order to have a more versatile application i want to understand different papers so i purchased some small print paper print pulling paper I guess that's the word I for it uh, from Strathmore and I have seen recommendations for a paper specific to paper marbling that people are use that actually has um, I can't remember if it's acrylic or latex um, in it so it's a very smooth durable paper I'm not sure if that's of interest to me because it's such a specialty thing um, and I'm just an I'm just kind of a rookie amateur playing around in my house um, so I do, uh, you know, I do accumulate a lot of prints and they're beautiful and um, I just, I just love the act of doing it. I feel the same way about my gel plate. I just love doing that process. But I thought it would be fun to take the uh, marble papers and see if I could do some botanical prints on that what could I achieve um, and then could this be applied into some collage and I was really happy with the results of using just a couple plants from outside uh, some acrylic paint my small gel plate um, and um, you can use the gel plate to do both masks and you can use it almost for actual like stamps so when you lay a plant down onto a fully um, painted gel plate surface and you print on it obviously the plant is masking um, onto the paper and then when you lift the plant up you have what we call a ghost print and you can pick that up either on its own if you go quickly or you have to lay down another level of paint so it was super fun to fool around with <clears throat> these as backgrounds um, I will say in my gel plate and in my journaling which is where i end up using a lot of these papers for collage and um, backgrounds these are a little bit more flashy than my kind of earthy subtle sense and um yeah so i think with that in mind as i move forward with making papers i want to kind of t i want to dial it back so that the papers can be used in those journal applications and collage um you know getting comfortable with ripping them up stamping onto them and again i think that whether they're going into a uh, collage or you want to make them into cards or use them for wrapping paper um 
or you're gonna you know incorporate them into a book um, I think that um, yeah understanding as you go into that print what your what your hope for is it all everything I've made so far has just been fooling around trying to um, understand what happens with the paint which paints disperse how to water them down what uh, surfactant do I need to add or how much um, you know there's um, you know the stones patterns and there's a ton of different patterns you can achieve with your combs and your rakes so looking at how those colors interplay um, I think is helpful when you're um, moving forward with application so for now it's just a lot of fun and I can see myself um, putting these uh, into wrapping paper like I said or cards um, or just admiring them but I've been having a lot of fun it's been a great way for me to jump back into some of the journaling that I love to do and get into my sketchbooks and pull a bunch of different uh, mediums together. So I, I'm super grateful for the heat press, um, the paper marbling, um, and as you will see coming up, there's quite a few other uh, mediums that I want to um, pull in including encaustic so the summer has just started um my niece is coming to stay with me for a week uh, she has her own uh, art agenda she's already dropped off she's up at girl scout camp um but she dropped off stuff before she went and there's an art book that's like this thick full of activities and she was picked out like eight <laughs> I was like let's do it so that will be its own special art agenda but I'll be pulling her into to some of the other things so there's a lot of ha creative um, energy happening of course I love botanicals and everything is blooming so I feel super inspired by that and um, yeah so let's see if we can bring it all together and, and yeah, I will look forward to sharing that with you throughout the coming months. So I think on that note, I want to leave you with um, just a little glimpse into the paper marbling book that I picked up. There are quite a few to choose from. And this particular one is Contemporary Paper Marbling by Lucy McGrath. I had to reference it there. Um, and yeah, see again if this is something you'd like to add to your library and your skill set.
as a cliche We're on the run This is what we waited for Take my hand, we'll make it somehow We can't miss out I'm done living life with the lights out portion of the video. I don't have a ton of knitting to share because it's been uh, unseasonably warm here in the northern part of Maine and I have not felt as drawn to uh, work with that material but I do have a finished sweater and I wanted to make sure that I included it so I've decided to pull my quilting and fiber arts all together into one segment. Welcome. I just like to reiterate here at the beginning how deeply grateful I am for those that contribute financially through Patreon or through coffee. Um, the production of this vlog requires a significant amount of time and effort, resources, and um, that is an encouraging and humbling uh, gesture that comes my way. And again, I am deeply grateful. If you are liking and subscribing and commenting and creating traction and momentum around this particular project, thank you so much. I also deeply appreciate um, moving this vlog forward and I couldn't do it without all of you. Thank you. Right. Well, I have been very busy. Uh, as you have seen, my niece came to stay for a week. We headed into the cabin. We did lots of other projects. I did some paper marbling with her. Um, and there was a lot of paper collage and, you know, making fairies and popcorn and Belgian waffles and Lord of the Rings. And so uh, I did not find myself um, in a position to do a ton of uh, more concentrated work on uh, my knitting and also anything on my quilting. So what I have here is really the, what 
I've been able to do the past couple days that she's been gone and I kind of wanted to reorganize myself figure out where I am in a number of different processes because I have a bunch to share and a bunch of experimentation I want to do forthcoming uh, and so I decided to kind of give my craft room a little overhaul and evaluate what was where, etc. And the first thing that came up for me was the quilt for Cameron, which is the Star Pop quilt. And haha, this is so convenient. This is by Quilty Love. And I don't have my readers on. Emily. Can't read it, but maybe you can. So this is the Star Pop quilt. I made this pattern for my niece using a Ruby Star Society uh, fabric from Sarah Watts, you might recall, and I decided to use it again to do this particular uh, quilt for my nephew Cameron. So I moved through and I created a whole um, set of blocks and I went to create the mirrored set in the same fabric and I have come up two half square triangles short and I cannot find remnants of the fabric anywhere which leads me to believe that I used all of it and so I'm a bit uh I'm a bit um that's what I'm looking for uh stuck uh I have to just commit to substituting with a different fabric and I think that'll be fine um the, gonna try not to let perfection be the enemy of great and finished and complete so I think what I'm gonna plan to do is just substitute in a couple extra half square triangles I had which have a similar color family and um, just hope that that as we all know uh, when you move away it will uh, be unnoticeable somebody mentioned like I'm not able to see it galloping on a horse sitting backwards so that's where I'm that's kind of my metric for deciding what to do because <laughs> I I definitely got to a point where I was looking at it and I was like I can't I have to order more fabric and I don't want more of this fabric um, I don't see another use for this particular thematic fabric uh, it's all around fishing and fly fishing and so I was like nope I'm just gonna make do with what I have so uh, I've come to that decision I did sleep on it um, and I'm gonna try to finish that next set of blocks I am eight blocks away from completing the whole quilt and so I anticipate next time I see you uh, that that quilt top will be finished and I will be thinking about my next one or working on it uh, you saw me start to do that with Madison and uh, Annie's quilt. They're my two nieces. And I purchased the Mia, I think is it Mia Charo? Uh, she's an illustrator and fabric designer for Free Spirit Fabrics. And I picked up a couple um, of her sets. One is Autumn Friends and one is like it has to do with dogs and I'm using the bridges quilt pattern which I saw listed in free spirit fabrics website but I'm having to amend a bunch a bunch I'm having to amend measurements to make the panel work in this particular pattern it's not a heavily pieced pattern uh, it's a lot of long strips as you saw with borders but my height and length isn't necessarily the same in the panel and so I am amending some things things will be shorter um, so I needed to do some thinking about that and planning because I think those two quilts I am going to try to get finished in August so I will have at that point four quilts to be backed we'll see how that goes um, Cameron's birthday is in October so this will be perfect to have quilted and bound for him for that occasion and the girls uh, I just wanted to work with that fabric so I picked it up for them uh, so that's kind of the quilting I am still working on the hand stitching uh, I took that with me to the cabin Madison was working on her small hand stitching quilt and I was working on the Yokositos uh, thousand pyramids block which I'll be turning into a bag and yeah I'm just kind of whittling away at that uh, it's a great project um, for me in the summer because it's not laying on my lap and uh, I can just sit and do small piecing so perfect I think that's really it for quilts uh, 
I'm excited about what's next. I'm excited about kind of wrapping up the children. Um, uh, Cameron has, and I've spoken about it, uh, he and I have talked about a more mature quilt for him um, with less uh, kind of patterned and thematic fabric in homespun fabrics and he's picked out a couple uh, patterns for that and so that'll be uh, hovering around my radar probably um, at the end of the fall as I start to gather fabrics for that but yeah so I'm feeling really good about Cameron's fa uh, quilt and moving it off the workbench and moving on with some easy piecing for the girls and then hand stitching. The other thing uh, that I wanted to highlight here is my finished roots and shoot sweater. This is by Tati Lutzak and I am um, really happy with the overall fit. There's a couple changes I made to this. Uh, the first one is I ended up using the shaping from my Drema by Jennifer Steingass, Knit Love Wool, uh, on the sides. And so I did some waist shaping. I, let's see what else did I do? I think that might be it, that's different. Um, I may have added some length, um, you know, those types of minor modifications that are custom uh, versus what the pattern designer has highlighted, you know, three inches for this. And so I just like the look of something better um, than what she noted. So the sleeves end in a corrugated rib, and I did the corrugate, corrugated rib here. I did go back and pick up the neckline, and I did a single crochet for this. I had concerns when I finished because it was rolling and it wasn't holding its shape, and it still has a bit of a, of a roll. I don't know if you can see it. Dun, 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 dun. Kind of right here, it kind of flares out. Uh, but I did block it and um, I soaked this in uh, warm water for a while, pulled it out, spun it out in my laundry, and then I um, just kind of fluffed um, the yoke area to smooth it out, let all those fibers relax, but I did block, meaning I used pins and I shaped this neckline um, to really see if I could make sure that that would lay flat. I have tried it on and there's enough tension on the shoulder so when it's on the body, this does pull a little bit and you get a nice kind of flat neckline where that crochet is. Ultimately, I did end up crocheting the neckline in two strands of the new Tiden um, unspun yarn and uh, I had originally tried like a DK weight brown because I thought that might add more structure and it would be easier. That didn't work. It was like really misshapen um, up here. The tension wasn't correct. So I went back and I did do it in the unspun, holding two strands together. The whole sweater is done in a mix of um, New Tedon, the main color and that kind of kind of eggy mauve yellowy color is held with one strand of knitting for olive mohair silk and then the contrast is two strands of the unspun new Tiden yarn from Honor Rock Air. So this is my first um, sweater I've worked with from uh, Honor Rock Air. It's beautiful, it's light, um, it has a nice shape. I was concerned when I put it in the water with the mohair that it might just come out as this kind of fuzzy mass. So I had my reservations, uh, but it didn't. It's performed beautifully. The fabric is really lovely um, and I can wear this uh, next to skin. So putting on a camisole with it will be perfect and um, putting it over a dress, but it is uh, 90, degrees Fahrenheit here in the state today so I uh, didn't take too many shots with this on we'll, we'll have to make a debut probably uh, in late September so exciting to have that off the projects I'll be focusing on now are my yell by Marie Wallen that I'm knitting in Spindrift and I am um, I put a ton of time into that this morning and I'm almost finished uh, a repeat that I was kind of stuck on with some color coordination so I'll be sure to highlight that in the upcoming episode at the end of the month and I'm going to be working on the Hobbit vest by uh, Fragonet designs for Cameron and I'm knitting that with Shetland uh, water wheel. I get confused sometimes uh, yarn. So I had started that and I tabled it while I finished this and I've been thinking about 
uh, a couple sweaters that I'd like to cast on. One is in Peace Fleece and it's a cable and the other is a new Drema in Let Low Be. So um, I have been very inspired by the Wooly Thistle lately and watching some of the vest projects that have been coming out of their knit along for vests and I always love to peruse their kits. Um, I'm also very excited that uh, Corinne at the Wooly Thistle has moved forward in opening a brick and mortar shop. Uh, so that's a real... Um, boon for the knitting community here in the Northeast or if you're visiting the Northeast of the United States uh, she is located in uh, New Hampshire so um, I'm really excited for her and for her team and yeah so I've been very enthusiastic about the knitting catching up with some of the podcasters that I really enjoy um, and looking at the shop update with the Wooly Thistle. If you're not familiar um, they feature a variety of kind of steadfast yarns at least in my book like peace fleece let low be ralma uh, jameson's uh, you can find those there and she also has a variety of different yarns that she's procured from different uh, small mills uh, minimally processed fibers etc so well done and um, if you are shopping with corinne i have an affiliate link it's listed down below uh, at no cost to you little kick back to me so if you'd like to support the podcast and you're buying books or yarn or notions uh, you can check out the woolly thistle and also support fiber trek at the same time it's my little plug for the woolly thistle uh to, they're not a sponsor of this podcast but um but i think that's been um great work and it's been a great resource for me um, for some of these kind of just steadfast yarns as I mentioned. Um, I don't shop much at local yarn stores. I don't really have one close to me um, and I don't make a lot of time in my life to go out and shop because of my commuting schedule and my commitment to being in two places uh, for family and so I find it much easier to go right to uh, specific websites, uh, people that I enjoy online and get what I need. I don't necessarily procure a lot of yarn and um, but when I do I I kind of know where to go speaking of which you may remember I did purchase the Alice Starmore class and I have not felted that finished belt yet and I will get to that I'm hopeful uh, soon so that's been kind of hanging around so I've got sweaters I want to finish that embroidery kind of structural art piece by Alice Starmore and I have um, Cameron's vest so that has been the knitting update for oh, and the yell don't forget the yell uh, that's been the knitting update for this uh, beginning of July I'm so glad that you took some time to join me and that you kind of you know indulge my curiosity in all of these different mediums I'm as I have talked about in the past just so enthusiastic about this new kind of art life that I have created for myself I never took art in school or college and so I'm just enjoying looking at all and procuring all and um, trying out all of the mediums to see what I can build on my own Thank you again, as I said, many fond wishes and blessings. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, bye.